viewers, I'm your host Shivangi Mishra with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India has officially been handed over the presidency of G20 for next one year. Leaders around the world are placing their hope in New Delhi and many observers are expecting that now when India is at the chair of the G20 presidency, the protracted Russia-Ukraine war could see its final days. India has always been in favour of peace and in dialogue and diplomacy as its favoured form of foreign policy. They say now is the time for India to take its place as a global leader in this increasingly divided world. Have a look. Prime Minister Modi was correct when he said that this is not an era of war. I believe that ending Russia's war is a moral imperative. Prime Minister Modi, when speaking of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, stated that this is not an era of war. The U.S. Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, emphasized the same during her recent visit to India. She also added that Modi's stance was the dominant view of policymakers in the backdrop of a protracted Russia-Ukraine war. Earlier, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, and the U.N. General Secretary, Antonio Guterres, had also supported Prime Minister Narendra Modi's stance and his advice of peace to President Putin, and had urged both sides to cease all forms of aggression. India has vowed to maintain only one position, which is that of peace. India has time and time again mentioned, on all platforms across the world, that the needs of its citizens and world peace are its top diplomatic priorities. It is because of this pro-peace attitude that India has been able to retain friendly relations with both the West and Russia during a time when the world has become increasingly polarized and divided. In his recent visit to Russia, a confident Jai Shankar, the Indian foreign minister, said that India will continue to buy Russian oil, for it was advantageous to Delhi and its people. It is our fundamental obligation to ensure that the Indian consumer has the best possible access uh, on the most advantageous terms to international markets. And in that respect, uh, quite honestly, uh, we have seen that uh, the uh, India-Russia relationship has worked to advantage. So if it works to my advantage, I would like to keep it in that, keep that going. Only days after Jai Shankar's statement, in what could be called a major diplomatic Indian victory, owing to its consistent pro-peace position, the U.S. Treasury Secretary said in an interview to Reuters that India could buy as much oil as it wanted from Russia as long as it avoided using Western service providers that were bound by the G7 price caps, which keep oil prices low, but also squeeze Russian revenue from oil. The United States and its allies in the group of seven nations continue to take steps to prevent Russia from profiting from their oil supply by putting a cap on prices. However, this would not apply to India. Observers say that India is in position to quickly rise to prominence as a significant geopolitical and economic force. From under 2% prior to the Russia-Ukraine war, Russia's proportion of India's oil imports increased to an all-time high of 23% in September. Russia clearly appreciates India for its economy-focused and its own citizen-first diplomacy. Посмотрим на Индию. Талантливый очень народ, целеустремленный, с таким здравом внутреннего развития. Он, конечно, добьется выдающихся результатов. Индия добьется выдающихся результатов в своем развитии. Сомнений никаких нет. И полтора почти миллиарда человек. Вот это потенциал. Still heavily embroiled in the protracted war, Russia has stated its intention to leave Kherson city, the only regional capital it has taken control of since the war began in February. 
While some speculate that withdrawal will only be a temporary break for both sides to recover and resume fighting, there are a few optimists that do not expect the fighting in the region to resume. Leaders around the world are placing their hope in New Delhi, and many observers expect that when India assumes the G20 presidency, the war could see its final days. India has consistently been in favor of peace and in dialogue and diplomacy as its favored form of foreign policy. Now is the time for India to take its place as a global leader in this increasingly divided world. Moving on, Sri Lankan economy is desperately waiting to emerge out of crisis. Soaring inflation, a weakening currency and low foreign exchange reserves have left the island nation of 22 million people struggling to pay for imports of essentials such as food, fuel and medicine and is in dire need of an IMF bailout. The government has claimed that it can bring down the unprecedented inflation levels under control within a year if the country comply with the strict reforms that are to be taken. Sri Lanka has postponed a round of debt restructuring talks initially expected to be held this week to allow central bank and treasury officials to provide clarification sought by the country's creditors. Sri Lanka needs to implement budget proposals and reform measures to help stabilize its economy and ensure it does not return to crisis, its central bank chief had said last week. Speaking at a news conference, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Nandalal Virasinghe, had earlier said that getting financial assurances, completing the debt restructuring process and getting the International Monetary Fund approval will be necessary. If you look at the budget for 2023, it doesn't talk about all these things. It's all about with the confidence that the economy will be stabilized next year. So what are the next important structural reforms? What are the next important reforms that, that would prevent us falling back into this kind of a crisis? Soaring inflation, a weakening currency and low foreign exchange reserves have left the island of 22 million people struggling to pay for imports of essentials such as food, fuel and medicine and in dire need of an IMF bailout. The country is required to restructure its economic fundamentals not just for its immediate future but for the long-term economic goals too. This is where debt restructuring was important that we are asking our creditors to share part of the pain. But it's not fair that we are asking them to pay, you know, share the pain on behalf of us. We also have to show that we also share part of the pain. The island nation formally kicked off the talks in September after securing a preliminary 2.9 billion US dollar bailout with the International Monetary Fund a step on a path out of country's worst financial crisis in a decade. But it needs to secure financing assurances from key creditors including China, Japan and India before the funds can be dispersed. Last week, Treasury Secretary K.M. Mahinda Sirivardhana said that stabilizing the economy remained a challenge and the private sector must perform its role in aiding the government in pulling the economy out of crisis. The measures that we have taken, we see some stability right now, but the challenge is how we basically stabilize this further and go forward. That's not an easy task. That needs very committed and well thought out reform, uh, reforms and also the committed implement, implementation of the reforms with specific monitoring. Sri Lanka had earlier set a target of getting board-level IMF approval in December for the planned four-year program. Sri Lankan officials have also had talks with representatives from China Exim Bank and China Development Bank, which together hold about 4.3 billion US dollars in loans given to fund large infrastructure projects over the last 20 years. China is Sri Lanka's largest bilateral lender. 
Sri Lanka has been gripped by a deep financial crisis this year caused by record low foreign exchange reserves that has left the island of 22 million people struggling to pay for essential imports including fuel, food, cooking gas and medicine. Moving on, Afghan refugees in Pakistan have been facing increasing hostility. After the Taliban's takeover in Afghanistan in August of last year, hundreds of stories have arisen regarding the ill treatment of Afghan refugees in neighboring Pakistan. Let's take a closer look at the continued abuses suffered by Afghan refugees and their hostile reception in Pakistani territory. A viral video shows several Afghan refugees detained and tied with a rope in Pakistan's Karachi city. The detainees in the video were seen complaining that the police took away their cell phones and money. The shocking video was condemned by the world and was also criticized by the former Afghan president, Hamid Karzai. Karzai urged the government in Islamabad to treat Afghan refugees as per international laws and respect their human rights. In the backdrop of increasing hostility against Afghans, Karen Decker, the charge d'affaires of the U.S. mission to Afghanistan, also visited Pakistan as part of her listening tour to discuss the situation. Its attitude towards Afghanistan refugees has also changed. They are becoming cruel, they are becoming arbitrary to the extent that somebody like Hamid Karzai, who had actually connived in the coming of the Taliban for the second time back into Afghanistan, has been forced to raise this particular issue. Of the more than 6 million Afghans who were forcibly displaced from their homes by the end of 2021, 3.5 million were displaced within Afghanistan, while 2.6 million were hosted as refugees, making this one of the largest protracted refugee situations in the world. The vast majority of refugees from Afghanistan are living in Pakistan and Iran, which continue to host more than 1.3 million and 780,000 registered Afghan refugees, respectively. However, in recent years, Pakistan has shifted its policy towards Afghan refugees. It has not only restricted refugees at borders, but has also forced Afghans in the country to leave. As per the Afghanistan Embassy in Pakistan, more than 1,250 Afghan refugees in Pakistan have been detained within the past 50 days. Most of the Pak-Afghan border, which one used to be able to cross with ease, is now fenced and is refusing Afghans attempting to cross over. Pakistan's recent actions have not only sparked anti-Pakistan sentiments among Afghans, but the relations between Islamabad and Kabul are quickly turning toxic. They have 1.3 million Afghan people in Pakistan today. Uh, maybe a, a thousand that are detained in terms of uh, refugees, and, and this is based on President Karzai's statements, but there's a major population of Afghans there in Pakistan. I don't believe that they're treating every Afghan citizen bad, but I do think they are targeting specific populations of people who may have supported America in the West. As the situation in Afghanistan remains unpredictable and unstable, a large majority of Afghans who earlier fled are hesitant to return to their homeland. According to the World Bank, a sharp decline in public spending, lower household incomes, and a fall in demand for products has led to a vicious economic spiral in Afghanistan, which seems to get worse day by day. Global sanctions on the Taliban government have caused disruptions in the country's payment system, as crucial dollars previously earmarked for Afghanistan have been frozen. Constraints on supplies, which have further hampered private sector activities, force many businesses to close or scale down their operations. The plight of Afghan refugees seems everlasting, 
as they struggle for peace and stability, both at home and outside. Time now for Asia This Week, the stories from across the continent. South Korean and Saudi Arabian leaders play stronger ties this week in the fields of energy, defense industry and building projects as the oil-rich kingdom signed investment agreements worth 30 billion US dollars with South Korean companies. Prince Mohammed arrived in Seoul on Thursday from Bali, Indonesia, where he had participated in a conference of the Group of 20 or G20 major economies. Yoon hoped to see South Korean companies' participation in projects such as the Neom Smart City project in Saudi Arabia and further cooperation in defense industry and future energy such as hydrogen, his office said in a statement. Prince Mohammed noted the role of South Korean businesses over the years in the development of Saudi Arabia's national infrastructure and wanted to see stronger cooperation with South Korea based on the trust built between the two countries. Rinai had introduced a new logistics center in Kasugi city, Aichi prefecture. It controls the logistics of Rinai products such as laundry dryers, hot water heaters and so on. They are produced in factories. In order to meet the needs, Rinai established a stable supply chain and digitized a modern logistics center. It is worker friendly and compensates for human labor shortages with a large number of robots. え、Every day, about 1,500 product panels are brought into and taken out of this center. The product is managed by a QR code. To avoid wasting space, armed robots are assigned to the delivery area. Carrying robots are capable of lifting up to 700 kilograms. 60 robots could replace 20 human workers. Rinai's efforts to make progress of DX in logistics have proven effective in reducing transportation costs and human labor power. It will reduce the cost of Rinai's products and keep customers around the world happy. Yokohama City is enthusiastically promoting decarbonization and advocating zero carbon Yokohama. Yokohama City has progressive industrial area. It is gathering companies that have sympathy to the decarbonization policy of Yokohama City. Yoglena is the main constituent of Yokohama City's biofuel organization. It established a promotional plan to produce bio jet fuel and biofuel for diesel engines from algae and abolish the use of cooking oil. Yuglena has already made abroad overseas developments. It will contribute to global decarbonization. ま、Asia Smart City Conference and International Conference for Smart Cities was hosted by Yokohama City. At the conference, Yokohama City introduced the efforts of decarbonization and SDGs through cooperation between the city and companies. 
Foreign inspectors visit companies directly to inspect various technologies and it is an opportunity for companies to expand their technology overseas. Yokohama City is biggest city in Japan. Its administrative activity to direct future industry will affect other local governments and the Japanese government. Moving on. With various cultures spread across the country, there are countless festivals celebrated in India. India celebrates the most number of cultural and religious festivals than any other country in the world. Celebrations in India are often observed with grandeur. Today we have brought for you a unique festival, Boita Bandana, also known as Boat Festival of Bhumneshwar. Water bodies from ponds to sea beaches look colourful as people observe the traditional worship of boats on the festival of Boita Bandana in India's eastern state of Odisha. Braving the winter morning chill, hundreds of people throng the rivers and other water bodies to celebrate Boita Bandana, a ritual that recalls the state's great maritime tradition. The festival is a commemoration of the maritime glory of Odisha and is observed every year on Kartik Purnima. Men, women and children celebrate the festival by setting afloat miniature boats to mark the occasion. People come near water bodies to set afloat boats traditionally made up of banana stems and banyan leaves and in urban areas it's made of paper. The festival marks end of the holy month of Kartik, witnessing people of all ages sailing miniature boats adorned with incense sticks, earthen lamps, flowers, fruits and coins into the water. हम जो छोटा एक नौका का एक मॉडल बनाते हैं उसमें हम जनरली जो कदली बनाना ट्री जो होता है इसका जो पार्ट होता है इसमें बनाते हैं और इसमें पान रखा जाता है फूल दिया जाता है दीदी दिया जाता दिया जाता है भोग दिया जाता है सेवरल पीपल विजिटेड बिंदु सागर लेक एंड फ्लोटेड टाइनी बोट्स एंड ऑफर्ड पूजा एट लिंगराज टेंपल दे आल्सो प्लेस्ड लिट दियास एंड केप्ट पीटल लीव्स एंड नट्स ऑन द मिनीचर बोट्स even though Kartik Purnima is celebrated in many other states, the tradition of floating of miniature boats is unique to Odisha. These boats are floated along with lighted lamps, beetle leaves, flowers, milk, cracker fruits and coins to mark a thousand years old boat festival. It is believed that our ancestors used to take boats to Indonesia to bring items for the state. Along with it, people also perform religious rituals to take a holy dip. पहले जमाने में क्या होता था कि हमारे साथ भाइयाँ रहते थे जो कि business purpose के लिए इस टेसिया की जैसे इंडोनेशिया हो और भी जो बहुत जगह हैं business purpose के लिए जाते थे. Last five days of the auspicious month of Kartik. are called Panchuka of which the last day is known as Kartik Purnima. It is considered a significant day to celebrate the maritime glory of Odisha. Many devotees also believe that tradition is meant to offer prayers to their ancestors and seek their blessings. States across the country host numerous achievements. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.